Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Medical Board of California Interim Board Meeting. This meeting is being conducted via WebEx. Public comments will be heard for each agenda item for individuals wishing to speak. To be ready for public comment, we ask you please ensure your comments can be heard clearly by being connected to the audio of this meeting through the proper method. If you're having difficulty hearing the audio of this meeting, it could be because the device you're connecting with has bandwidth limitations. If you do have difficulty hearing the audio of this meeting using your device, please click the ellipsis button at the bottom of the WebEx application or the audio and video item, menu item at the top of the WebEx application, and then select switch audio. You'll see an option to call in and will be provided with a telephone number, access code, and attendee ID that can be used to connect to the meeting audio via phone. Using the information provided, it will automatically disconnect your device's audio and connect your phone to the name you joined the meeting with. By using this method, if you're still having audio problems with, this, with your device, this will allow you to still participate and hear, hear the audio of the board meeting. Please see the instructions on how to connect link on the last page of the meeting agenda for step-by-step -step WebEx instructions, including screenshots. Thank you, President Lawson. You can now start the meeting. Thank you, Sean, and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to the board members and to the members of the public and our staff uh, for joining us for this interim meeting via WebEx. Since the meeting is being conducted today via WebEx, I will ask that all board members and presenters please do announce yourselves uh, by name before speaking for clarity of the official record. All board members and our staff are able to unmute themselves to speak during the meeting, but please do place yourselves back on mute when not speaking to reduce background noise for all participants. Following this online meeting etiquette will ensure the best audio quality for everyone. During each call for comments from board members and speakers, we will ensure that all comments that can be accommodated are heard before we proceed with the agenda. This is an official business meeting of the Medical Board of California, and as such, disruptions of the board's business will not be tolerated. Government Code Section 11126.5 allows the board to remove people who willfully interrupt a meeting and to clear the room or virtual space if order cannot be restored by, remo by removing or muting the disruptive people. We do have a designated time on the agenda today for public comment, and we'll ask for public comment on each agenda item. The board's IT staff will assist me with receiving public comments via the WebEx platform during this meeting. The board welcomes public comment on any item on the agenda during open session, and it is the board's intent to ask for public comments prior to the board taking action on any agenda item. During each agenda item, the host moderating this WebEx event will activate the hand raising and Q&A features of WebEx, and will ask anyone wishing to make a comment to please indicate so by raising their hand or entering yes in the Q&A window. The host will then call on individuals who indicated they wish to make public comments by name. And when called upon, the host will unmute your microphone and they will have you have five, excuse me, three minutes to make your public comment. The host will audibly announce when 15 seconds remain to conclude the public comment. After the three minutes have lapsed, the individual will be placed back on mute. Only one public comment per agenda item is allowed per attendee. Please do refer to page two of the agenda for WebEx instructions on how to connect from the link on the agenda and additional instructions. Uh, during agenda item, um, I think it's agenda item two, actually, I have it written as agenda item three. During agenda item two, public comments on items not on the agenda, the board has limited the total public comment period to 40 minutes. After 40 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. During public comment on any other agenda item, 20 minutes will be allowed for the comment period, and after 20 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. Each person, again, will be limited to three, comment, three minutes per agenda item. I want to remind all speakers to please stay on topic and keep your comments to the allotted time or less. Today's meeting will be run according to the Open Meeting Act as required by law. And while the agenda um, does allow for this meeting to go until 5 p.m., we do plan to end today's meeting by noon. Um, and I suspect it may take uh, even uh, a shorter period of time um, than that. Um, I'd like to now officially call the meeting to order and ask that board members please unmute your computers. Uh, if uh, Ms. Lopez, if you could please call the roll. Dr. Hawkins? Here. Dr. Thorpe? Here. Dr. Helzer? Here. Mr. Brooks? Present. Dr. Mahmood? Yes. Ms. Shong? Here. Dr. Balat? Here. Madam President Lawson? Yes, present. Thank you. I believe a quorum is present. Uh, board members, if you could please remute your computers. I would like to remind the members again that we will be taking a roll call vote uh, on any action item. 
And we will move on now to agenda item two, which is public comment on items not on the agenda. Before I ask for public comments, I would ask individuals making public comments today to please not discuss any pending complaints, pending licensing applications, or any pending disciplinary actions that may come before the board for a decision. Such decisions are considered ex parte communications as they could provide information to members that is outside of the record in violation of the Administrative Procedure Act. Therefore, such discussions could create a conflict, could lead to a board decision being challenged in Superior Court. The board can receive comments regarding the board's processes in general, but it cannot receive comments on specific case circumstances where the decision is still pending. In addition, the board requests the public to address the board as a whole and not individual members. Um, and again, please be aware that public comment during this agenda item should provide information to the board members and is not a discussion between the board members and the public. The only action board members can take is to listen to the comments and decide whether they want a future agenda item on the topic. No other action can be taken on the item at this meeting. Though this may at times seem like board members are not being responsive, complying with these guidelines is critical to ensure the rules of the Open Meeting Act are followed and to avoid compromising both the speaker's goals and the board's mission. If you do want to comment on an agenda item, please wait until we get to, to that agenda item. Comments at this time are only for items that are not on our agenda. Please do limit your comments to three minutes or less. Sean, I'll now, now ask you to uh, call for public comments. Thank you, President Lawson. The Q&A window and the hand raising feature both available. You can uh, raise your hand by toggling the little hand icon next to your name in the participant section. Or if you have a question, you can just type you'd like to make a public comment or anything in the Q&A box. No, no need to type out the full question. Uh, we'll just use it to call on you to ask your question audibly. So uh, first up here, we have Kristen Jensen. Kristen, you should be receiving a prompt on your end unmute. Like we lost Kristen. Um, Kristen, I'm going to send you a prompt. Yeah, you should receive a prompt on your end that you have to accept. There you go, Kristen. Looks like your line's open. I think I got this. Can you all hear me? We can hear you. Please go ahead. Great. Uh, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here. I'm Kristen Jensen. I'm a doctor at UCLA, and I'm speaking to request a change to the board's physician name change policy. The current name change policy requires physicians to practice under their legal name. This policy negatively impacts many physicians, most commonly women, surrounding decisions about name changes. To paint the picture a bit clearer, I got married after being a practicing doctor for four years. I changed my name legally for personal reasons and then realized the profound negative impact it had on my career. It impacted patient care. I had patients who switched doctors because they didn't realize I was the same doctor. I had pharmacies that got confused and sent prescription refill requests to the wrong doctor. I had nurses who couldn't figure out how to page me since my maiden name, which was the only way they knew me, was no longer in the system. In addition, this negatively impacted my research identity and CV as all the papers I had published under my maiden name were no longer linked to my name. It has led to significant confusion with my professional colleagues, both at UCLA as well as across the country. These are just a few examples of the negative impacts it had on me, and I, of course, am just one example of an incredibly common situation that happens to many physicians. In addition, there would be a relatively straightforward fix to this. Under a revised policy, physicians would still have to notify the board after any legal name change, but would then select the option to continue to practice under their former name. Clear policies could be enacted to ensure that this is done in a manner that avoids fraud and any other medical legal concerns. Both the legal name and the maiden name would be tied to the same license number and doctors would have to elect their professional name and only practice under this name. I appreciate the California Medical Board's commitment to diversity, equity and inclusion, and I think that this could be an important and easily fixable step to continue to assert this commitment. In addition, recently, one of the main medical journal publishers, De Gruyters, enacted a similar name change policy to promote LGBTQ friendly policy. And so while I've focused mostly on the impact this has on female physicians, there are many other groups to whom this policy would positive impact as well. In addition, I've discussed this proposal with numerous physicians, as well as the CMO of UCLA and the president elect of my professional medical society in California, and this has garnered unanimous support. Given this, I'm proposing that I work with a member of the board on drafting an updated name change policy, and I'm also proposing that we move this to a formal agenda item at a future board meeting. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your public comment. 
Uh, I'm going to go ahead and call in Monty Goddard, I believe. Monty would like to. Monty, you should be getting a prompt on your computer. It looks like you are connected to the audio on your phone, but um, the request should pop up on your computer too. I neglected to mention earlier because I didn't see any call-in users, but you can press star three to toggle raising your hand if you're just on a call-in only line. But again, I don't see any call-in users at this time. I'm going to try one more time to see if you can type me something in the Q&A box too if you're having any trouble. Hey, Manny, I'm, I'm not seeing you coming off mute. I'm not getting any additional messages from you either. So at this time, President Lawson, I don't see any additional requests in queue. Okay, if he does come back on, I, I suppose we can um, come in and allow him to comment during the next agenda item. Um, thank you for your public comments. Uh, we will move on now to agenda item three, which is- Sorry, remember President Lawson Sorry. had a late request here for Michelle Montserrat Ramos. Okay. Uh, Michelle, go ahead. You should be receiving a prompt on your end. Michelle, looks Good like you're live. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Good morning. I am Michelle Montserrat Ramos, and I am with Consumer Watchdog. I would normally introduce myself to new board members, but I wanted to spend today focusing on my volunteer advocacy team. I wanted to stress to you just how committed the advocates who speak before you are at these meetings. We will have a brand new advocate speaking to you today. We also have a special advocate. Her name is Maria Ivada Navarrete. I'm sure she plans on speaking about it today during her public comment, but I just wanted to emphasize that she is here today on what should have been her brother's 31st birthday. Her brother died just two years ago. All of us that have lost our family members needlessly through medical negligence knows what she is going through today, and we stand in solidarity with her. I just want you to understand, especially the new board members, that this young woman is selflessly spending her time honoring her brother today by advocating for the rights of other Californians. One of our other special advocates could not be at the Sunset Review hearing because it was held on the same day as her father's memorial service, but she still sent in her comments. The advocates on this team take days off from work or they are cutting hair while listening to the meeting and stepping away to offer public comment. They leave their offices and walk outside to speak to you, whether it is a sales office or a teacher in a classroom. We don't usually have the time to emphasize the level of commitment of our advocacy team, but I wanted to do so today on this very special day. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. It looks like we got uh, Monty here now connected with phone. So uh, Monty should be receiving that prompt on the phone line now to press star six to unmute. Good morning. Good morning, Monty. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. My name is Monty Goddard. I'm a California resident and licensed civil engineer. Thank you for this opportunity to speak this morning. After reviewing this meeting's agenda and the related materials, I had not intended to provide any public comment. However, uh, recently, I recently received board notification Mr. Varghese has selected as the board's new executive director. I'm compelled to com congratulate Mr. Varghese and at the same time urge him to vigorously pursue his predecessor's passion to effectively and aggressively roll out the updated prescribing guidelines the board approved at your last quarterly meeting. Effectively executing the board's repeatedly expressed intent to engage physicians pharmacists, the pharmacy board, and the investigative units of the medical board and the state AG's office will require significant effort and skill. It will be no small undertaking, but a successful execution is critical to improving the ongoing plight of Californians afflicted with severe chronic or intractable pain. I wish the entire board and Mr. Varghese in particular, Godspeed in the successful rollout of Dr. Thorpe's and Mr. Brooks led task force, long overdue, but very much appreciated update 
of the board's opioid prescribing guidelines. Thank you. Thank you, Money. Uh, at this time, President Lawson, I don't see any additional requests. Okay, thank you. I'm glad we had the opportunity to get those public comments in. Um, thank you again for your public comments. We will now move on to agenda item three, which is board member communications with interested parties. As a reminder, this is an opportunity for board members to disclose if they've communicated with interested parties on items that are coming up for discussion during this meeting. Um, to kick it off, I'll just report that I've had a variety of conversations with stakeholders in the administration, um, in the leg legislature, uh, particularly surrounding our sunset bill. Um, are there other members that have um, communications to report? Dr. Hawkins. Dr. Hawkins, please. I did participate in an FDA advisory committee meeting on composition of the next COVID uh, coronavirus vaccine and participated in a number of medical society conferences where I commented on individuals about the, what the medical board does and folks protecting their licenses and challenges that physicians and training are having with licensure from the two different types of licenses. Thank you. Thank you. Other, uh, Dr. Mahmood? Yeah, I spoke at uh, Society of Industrial Medicine, and it is nothing to do with board, but just to reassure them that board is vigorously uh, there to help the Californians and uh, protect the rights of people. But no vested interest, no nothing else. It's not not an individual meeting; it's a meeting with a lot of people. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mahmood. Uh, Mr. Chair, Madam. Yeah, Dr. Thorpe, please. Uh, yeah, I have spoken to. Um, one of the residency directors regarding uh, a candidate having difficulty getting his license prior to the deadline for hiring on July 1. Uh, that's at the University of Riverside, uh, Moreno Valley. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thorpe. Other communications with interested parties? Dr. Balat? Yes, um, similarly, um, I've spent with several program directors in California, some of the challenges with the PTLs and uh, individuals that have been out on maternity leave and the impact of the time frame and how that's impacting them being able to continue their uh, in their residency training. And so that's been a topic. And the second one um, has to do with uh, I I would like to be able to follow up and state this, that I will follow up with our chief medical officer at UCLA after hearing, which I've heard for the first time, if that's fine with the board. I think that's, I really do want to hear more about this uh, discussion that was presented this morning by a speaker. Dr. Mahmoud, one more time. Yeah, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, I just want to, uh, I think a couple of things I forgot. I spoke to two people who have applied for a license uh, from different states, Nevada and Kentucky. Uh, and I referred them to uh, Mr. Rajis, and uh, yeah, I think he has taken care of them. They're very clean case. They were applying for license. There was some delay. I think he's taken care of. I was Thanks. just reached out by them. I don't know them personally. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, some of those routine matters that come up as a matter of course, where we refer them, um, I don't know that they require our disclosure here, but it's always good, uh, both for members of the public to know that they can reach out to us and we'll forward their um requests and the information on to our staff and our team um but uh, that does happen uh with relative frequency with me um as well that i hear from people and refer them on to our staff uh, other board member communications with interested parties all right seeing none uh i guess we will open it up for public comment sean is the q a window and hand raising feature still available for anyone wishing to make a public comment Give everyone a couple of seconds here to see if anyone queues up. Just double checking here. I'm pretty awesome, but I don't see any requests. Great. We'll bring it back to the board and then we will move on to agenda item four, which is discussion and possible action on legislation. Mr. Bone, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam President. Good morning, members. Nice to see you all. If you look at the green and blue colored tracker chart, it indicates that there are only two bills that staff are recommending for discussion. 
but things are fluid sometimes in the legislature. So there was a change last night to one bill um, that I'll touch on in a moment. Uh, two bills I'll touch on in a moment. Um, with one exception that I'll get to, the bills in blue and green are not suggested, excuse me, the bills in blue are not suggested for discussion uh, because either they have not been amended since the prior board meeting or they were not amended in a way contrary to the board's position or values. As I mentioned a second ago, there were two of the bills on agenda that were amended last night, one of which um, uh, I believe requires for discussion, at least consideration today, and that is AB 1070, which is agenda item 4E. The other bill that was amended last night was SB 372, item 4N. That bill relates to name and gender changes. The amendments to that bill staff believe were clarifying in nature and are not contrary to the board's uh, position on that bill. Happy to discuss that in more detail if anybody, anybody wishes, of course. Um, before getting into the first item on the agenda, I, uh, which was SB 815, I did want to share with the members that I learned earlier this week that AB 796, the athletic trainer bill, is now a two-year bill and will not be moving forward any further this year. Hopefully, that will provide sufficient time to work out various concerns that have been raised by the board and other stakeholders relative to the consumer protection concerns we all had. So in summary, members, the revised proposed plan for the day is to start with SB 815, then move on to AB 1070, and finish with SB 357. Unless there's any questions that um, you, Madam President, and the other members have, happy to commence with SB 815. I think that sounds like a good plan. Any questions from board members before we start? Thank you, members. Appreciate your patience as things sometimes turn on a dime. SB 815, uh, is this the board's sunset bill? Since the prior board meeting, the board was amended to somewhat reduce the proposed fee amount from, for physician and surgeon initial and renewal licensure from $1,350 to $1,289. The updated fee amount is dependent upon a longer loan repayment term that would allow the board to extend payments of its current and anticipated loan amounts to a six-year period. Board staff are comfortable with this approach and expect that this updated concept will still allow the board to pay off our debt and begin to reserve, rebuild our reserve fund. Um, in the analysis that's on the we website and was shared yesterday with the members is an updated fund condition report that illustrates some of these factors. The other amendments to the bill were clarifying in nature and are noted on the first page of the analysis. The board's current position of support if amended does not speak to the fee amounts that are in the bill. Um, that was just not something that needed to be addressed at the prior board meeting. Accordingly, if the board is comfortable with the updated fee language, then no action would be required to update its position since it is silent on these matters regarding fees in the board's fiscal condition. We are fortunate to be joined today by Mr. Taylor Schick he is the Chief Fiscal Officer for the Department of Consumer Affairs, and Mr. Schick will provide some brief remarks about the board's fund condition in consideration of the revised fee amount. Um, Sean, can we raise him to status uh, panelist? Uh, Taylor's already with us. Taylor, you should be able to free up and meet yourself now. Great. Mr. Schick. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, good morning, Madam President and fellow members. My name is Taylor Schick, and I am the Chief Fiscal Officer for the Department of Consumer Affairs. Um, I believe in your package, uh, agenda item 4A, you do have a copy of the uh, fund condition scenario that includes the fee um, that is proposed in Senate Bill 815. Um, for those that are unfamiliar with a fund condition statement, uh, these are read uh, top to bottom, left to right. Uh, it really displays the board's fund, your special funds health each fiscal year. So when you look at the top of that, you'll see actual 
amounts for fiscal year 2020-21, actual amounts for 2021-22, a projection for the current year that we're currently in, which is fiscal year 2022-23, and then budget year through budget year plus five. So budget year is based on what is currently authorized in the Budget Act. Um, and then we do have modifiers built out into each of those budget years, budget year plus one through budget year plus five. And I can go over those in a little bit more detail. I'm um, reading it from top to bottom. And I don't, would it help if I shared um, the fund condition statement? Let's see if I can. That'd be very helpful. Thank you. Okay, just let me know if everyone is able to uh, view that. I do have it zoomed in. Um, it is a lot of information, so uh, let me know if it is uh, difficult to read and I can try to zoom in a little bit more. This is great, thanks. So here, no complaints. So th these are the fiscal years along the top, if you can follow along with that cursor. Uh, so we are displaying, you know, two years of actual costs. Right here is current year, so this is the year that's just about to end. Um, we do build in current year projections for uh, revenues, and then if we scroll down, uh, let me slow down here. This is the beginning balance that the board had in the fund when this fiscal year started. These are the revenues that we are projecting for the year broken into several categories. Uh, we have delinquent fees, renewal fees, uh, other regulatory fees, other regulatory licenses and permits. This is typically your initial uh, licensures. And then we have some miscellaneous fee categories for uh, interest from surplus money investment and other um, miscellaneous revenues. Right now we are projecting the board to bring in approximately $69 million in revenue. We also did work with the board to initiate a $8 million control section 14 loan. I'll go over that in just a second. Uh, from the Bureau of Automotive Repair to ensure uh, fund solvency through the end of this fiscal year. And then here at the bottom under expenditures is where we're projecting what the board's expenses are for the current year. Right now we are projecting the board to expend approximately uh, $73.6 million. Uh, we are acknowledging that the board is estimated to bring in about $2.8 million in unscheduled cost recovery. Uh, the majority of this is relation um, to probation monitoring costs that are reimbursed to the board. Um, additionally, we have about $685,000 in costs that are going to come out of the board special fund for a supplemental pension payment. Uh, those supplemental pension payments began in 2019-20 uh, and are going to run through 2024-25. Um, um, and then they will end. And then this last expenditure here of uh, approximately 4.9 million is for statewide prorata. And that is what the uh, board and all, uh, all DCA special funds uh, spend and pay for um, sort of administrative oversight of the general functions of state government. So this includes Department of Finance, State Controller's Office, Department of General Services, the Legislative Analyst Office. So all of those oversight and control agency roles, um, there's a prorata share that is applied to each um, board and Bureau special fund um, to support those costs. With all those um, items, including that $8 million loan, we are projecting the board to have a fund balance of approximately 7.5 million um, at the end of this fiscal year, which reflects approximately 1.1 months in reserve. I'm gonna scroll back to the top. And then in budget year, these numbers are all based on what is currently displayed in the governor's budget and what will be displayed in the budget act. Um, both uh, estimate for revenue as well as the authorized um, board expenditures of approximately 79 million. Um, and then looking forward, we're doing a couple of different things. We're doing a modifier. We have seen historically that the board's licensee population grows by about 1% um, year over year. So we are modifying revenue amounts to factor in that growth. Um, additionally, down here under expenditures, we um, after budget year, we do include about a 3% modifier uh, to the board's expenditure categories. Uh, that 3% really is deemed to capture sort of the annual growth that we see 
for general salary increases, the bargaining unit contracts that go through uh, that support not only uh, pay increases for the board staff, but for uh, state staff that the board essentially pays for. So that includes um, all of the investigators within the health quality investigation unit, all the staff within DCA. It also includes all the staff within all the various general um, oversight departments, Department of Finance, Department of General Services as well. So we have a 3% modifier built into both uh, the board's direct appropriation as well as the uh, statewide Parada line item. The estimated unscheduled cost recovery is based on a four year average of what it has been over those last four years. Um, right now, it's a little bit lower than what the board has brought in, um, is currently estimated to bring in this current fiscal year, um, but we will continue to monitor that and reflect any changes we see necessary. Um, we also did build in a modifier of about $4 million. Uh, this is just to try to reflect future uh, cost increases, either reflective of the board pursuing a budget change proposal, which would be an augmentation to their existing budget authority, or legislative change proposals, uh, which reflect um, changes made in um, existing legislation or future legislation that would increase the board's cost. Um, we might be aware that in the sunset bill, there's a complaint liaison, uh, liaison unit uh, that's going to increase the board's cost. So that would be sort of captured in that estimate of that $4 million. I do want to note that $4 million, we do carry it out, but it does not get built into that baseline budget amount. So that's why we're keeping it as a separate line item. So it's not um, being inflated year over year. It's just an estimate of $4 million starting in uh, 24, 25, and then just being projected ongoing. To the meat of the matter, with that fee increase to 1289, we are projecting uh, the board to bring in a little bit over, um, I want to say about $31 million in additional revenue. Um, while we will see an initial um, increase based on the uh, bill's effective period of January 1st, 2024, uh, the bulk of the revenue will not start coming in until fiscal year 24, 25, when we will see a full year of implementation of that fee increase. Um, we are building in that 1% growth modifier in those projections as well. This would bring up the board's level of revenue up to close to $100 million. Um, while that is over the board's current estimated expenditure level, um, as we see here, it's 82.5 million in 24, 25, it'll increase to 89 million in 24 or 25, 26. Yeah, you know, we're, we're seeing those increases. It is designed to hopefully not only cover the board's current expenses, cover board's um, increased costs over time, but also get the board out of its current debt situation, repay the existing uh, loans that the board has had to take out and restore the board's fund condition into its um, statutory mandated level, which is between two to four months in reserve. And that's where we see at this very end figure, uh, I believe in 2028-29, uh, that's budget year plus five of being at about $20 million in the fund or 2.6 months in reserve. And I think that will conclude my brief overview of the fund condition, and I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, Madam Chair, this is Dr. Thorpe. Dr. Thorpe, please. <clears throat> um, thank you, Mr. Schick. I appreciate your presentation. That's uh, very helpful to help us understand. One question I had is that does the 3% um, uh, that you budgeted in for increased costs, does that include the cost of the attorney general's office? So the 3% modifier does not factor in a potential cost increase uh, to the attorney general's office. Uh, we did see a cost increase, I think most recently in 2019, 20, I believe uh, for the board where they increased their rates. Um, but that 3% is more based on just the general um, it's based really on a, a 10 year average of when we looked at the board's expenditure growth, authorized expenditure growth, over those last 10 years, based on those general salary increases and retirement rate changes, it has grown uh, between about 3 and 4% year over year. So that 3% is an estimate on how we anticipate the board's expenditures to grow uh, based on just supporting the existing staffing levels. So my question, if I could do a follow up, Madam Chair. Um, Please. Just, I guess the, the, the lar one of the largest expenditures we have 
is the attorney general's office and um and we have really no control over that it's not something we can i mean they basically tell us um we're going to increase our costs and we have no choice so i i realize that that doesn't happen you know certainly doesn't happen every year but it, when it did happen a couple of years ago or in 2019 it was a dramatic increase in cost and uh it seems to me that they would be appropriate to to try and factor in in some way um the potential for that increase because i can't imagine that that's going to just stay the same for the next five years no, I do appreciate your comment. I will say one of the difficult things is when we look at these fund conditions, right? Um, they are being built point in time uh, based on what information we have available right now. As I go out, and I know I'm showing you a out year picture going to budget year plus five, five years, there's a lot of unknown variables. I will say the attorney general rate is an unknown variable. I don't know if they are planning to do any sort of adjustments to their existing rate. Uh, but I imagine that is something that would likely come along down the road as they are as same as the board impacted by those general salary increases for their staff. Um, so my thought would be, hopefully it would be captured within that general 3% growth modifier. Um, but if not, that is another potential cost pressure that the board may have in future years. It's just something that's unknown and uncertain at this point in time. And if I could just add on to Mr. Schick's comments, you know, Dr. Thorpe, uh, you know, that that's part of the goal, right? To get the months and reserves going back in the right direction. So that way we have, you know, a, a cushion, some room to absorb, um, you know, unanticipated expenses, like, you know, Mr. Schick stated, you know, so well. And then, you know, the other factor is, um, you know, we, we have, we come before the legislature for sunset review on a, you know, on that four year basis. Um, and so that provides for that ongoing check in and, you know, dialing in and adjusting fees, uh, and other, other matters, uh, you know, as necessary. So hopefully that's, um, that's helpful as well. Dr. Thorpe. I would just ask Madam Chair some, <laughs> just the, 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 the concern that I have is that the attorney general's office basically has to stay competitive with the private workforce and of attorneys and their the reason for increasing I, I understand it um that it's a that it's a you know a, a a desire to try and be competitive as much as possible with the private workforce and to retain excellent um attorneys in the in the attorney general's office so that pressure is going to continue to be there um for it's it's i mean i'm sure it's there today i i know that they're not competitive with the with the private workforce and uh, um, so my my concern is that there isn't a a a uh, a strategy to accommodate for that in this budget i mean maybe the 4 million that you've put in maybe that's accommodating maybe the 3% but we've got other things that are you know, as you pointed out, Mr. Schick, that are that are that are unanticipated, but we can anticipate this expenditure. I don't think it, I mean, maybe they aren't telling us that they're going to, but given the marketplace, given the the current situation of, uh, I, I can't imagine that they're going to stay that their their fees are going to stay the same for the next four years. Even it, it would be unrealistic for them to be able to retain their quality of staff. To do that, so I would just ask that there be some effort to try to anticipate what that cost might be, so that we don't end up using up all of these well-meaning reserves in other places and then not have adequate for for that major expense because it's a ma it is a you know it's it's a major expense it's million you know I don't remember the number exactly but. It, but the number of 70, 65 or $70 million comes to mind. I may be wrong, but it's, it's quite a bit. So I just, I would just ask for some recognition of that, of that potential um, major cost increase. And Dr. Thorpe, I think that, um, I mean, you raise a valid concern. You raise something that we confront on a, uh, 
you know, with some frequency, right? Um, as they look at those costs, and frankly, as we look at those costs year to year, because they can be highly variable year to year, depending. Um, uh, I mean, depending on frankly, external lawsuits against the board where we're facing significant ones this year, um, which was not something that was happening a couple of years um, back, where we had, you know, I guess, more uh, or less volatility in terms of those costs. Um, one thing um, or an area of opportunity that I think we have is to work in collaboration with them. And I, I believe our staff has been doing that much more closely um, so that we manage those costs better, so that we look ahead and, and really understand what those anticipated costs will be. Um, and, and again, keep ourselves collaborating and cooperating throughout the course of the year to better manage those costs as they come up. You're raising an, a valid point. I, unfortunately, I think Mr. Schick is right when we look at these fund conditions, we look at them at a point in time, right? Um, and we don't know exactly what's going to happen in the um, future. Um, but I think the opportunity there is for close collaboration with them and looking for opportunities, frankly, to um, uh, streamline the wrong word, but um, gain some efficiencies in the work that we're doing um, with that office. Um, it's also something the legislature, as we you know talk through these things, needs to be reminded about, right? Because so many of these costs really are outside of our control, whether it's uh, the statewide administrative expenditures costs, um, you know, which helps we help fund um, the state government, and frankly, right, rightly so, um, because we use those resources, whether it's HQIU or the AG's office or these various, um, you know, things that we're responsible for funding because we're part of the state government. So I, your your point is very well taken in this process. I, Madam Chair, I just I apologize. I just want to make that we I understand that there are unanticipated costs. I get that. And I it, but we have we have made an attempt in this budget or in this projected, you know, this uh whatever you call it, this fund analysis to to accommodate for those unanticipated costs in the administrative costs and in the IHQIU and in these other areas. But there is no accommodation for the potential in this one area where it's a, it is the most expensive piece of our expenditure budget. And that is the concern to me. I, we have, we have uh, had significant faltering budget wise in the past because of unanticipated changes in the AG's cost. And I would, all I'm asking is that there be some, just like there was for the um, uh, estimated cost, well, no, so I'm sorry, for the, uh, for the um, statewide administrative expenditure payment and for the you know the estimated cost for other for future things that there, there's a three percent adjustment made and the four million dollar adjustment made, but neither of those it sounds to me like have have been meant to accommodate for an unanticipated cost for the AG's office. My only concern, I realize that I think it's great that you're that you're collaborating with them. All of those things are great, but it seems un it seems fiscally irresponsible to me. Knowing that that's our major cost to not make an accommodation of some type to try and put in some additional buffer so that we don't come across that major obstacle again. Thank you. That's my last comment. Thanks, Dr. Thorpe. I think Mr. Bum. Um, yes, thank you, members. So um, just a couple of quick thoughts. Um, the the recent advent or the restoration of cost recovery effective last year, um, I think is at least mitigating uh, in some of these, uh, the expenses that Dr. Thorpe noted. Um, we're just starting to see, we're seeing the first fruits of that, uh, you know, play out. Um, and, you know, we'll know more in the future years about how that has an impact on, you know, on our costs. And, and then um, secondarily, the it's in the bill right now um, at the board's request, which is for petitioners who file a, uh, who are seeking penalty relief um, for them to pay a fee. And a substantial portion of those costs that the board bears with regard to processing and making determinations on those petitions 
directly relates to legal costs. So just a couple of thoughts I wanted to share on, on that, Dr. Thorpe, and, and, and how I think we have been trying to get ahead of some of those things. <clears throat> and then I think the expectation as well is that, you know, again, the, um, the reserve balance that we're, that we're building up um, along with, you know, the, the 3%, you know, modifier that Dr. Uh, that Mr. Schick mentioned uh, will, will, will hopefully be, you know, um, I think at least more progressive than, and forward thinking than, than perhaps we had been previously on, on some of these matters. That's my hope. That's my hope, but um, happy to certainly to answer any other questions, um, Madam President, that you or uh, the members may have on, on this or any other, you know, aspect. Again, very, um, uh, minor changes um, since, other than the fee amount, you know, other very minor changes since the the last time we met and discussed this. And uh, uh, again, if the board is comfortable with, uh, collectively is comfortable with um, the current language of the bill, then there's no action required. Uh, thanks, Mr. Brown. Are there other questions or comments from board members? Dr. Hawkins is right, Brooks, Madam President. Uh, okay, let's go to uh, Mr. Brooks, and then we'll go to Dr. Hawkins, and then others. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Slick. Thank you very much for you know putting this together. You know, my concerns are the same concerns that Dr. Thorpe has, and the concerns were more the concerns on the model itself. And I understand that when we're looking at budgeting, we look at you know the past five years and maybe three or five year uh, look forward when we're you know modeling budgets. You know, I wonder if we can model this budget tied to like a consumer price index or to real numbers. So that 3% would change based on the actual reality of the day. Meaning sort of like a, you have a, a non-fixed home loan where your interest rate might be at 4% and then in, you have inflation, your interest rate goes up to account for that. Can we change this model to reflect something more of a um, CPI type of program versus a model where you're guessing 3% over the next, you know, three to five years. Is that possible? Uh, all I'll say I could generally uh, take a look at that by building in the modifier based on the existing rate uh, with CPI. I will just note you know, this last year, whether or not it's going to be an outlier or not, um, may skew some of those figures, but it is something we can definitely look at whether or not we want to take a longer view of what the average uh, CPI growth would be. Um, but I, yeah, that is something uh, that we could note and take a look at based on the Department of Industrial Relations. They uh, report on California's consumer price index growth um, quarterly and annually, I believe, so we can pull those numbers. Yeah, because CPI growth usually equates with rage growth also. And so if the city attorney, or the city attorney, excuse me, if the attorney general's office is trying to be competitive and increasing salaries, and that's our, you know, largest, you know, focal point, if we're tied to, you know, their inflation rate, basically, um, we might be in a better fiscal position, especially when it comes to our reserves, to capture that increased costs. And that way, it takes some of the guessing away from trying to estimate, you know, an average over the next three to five years. So those are my uh, my comments or suggestions. Uh, thanks, Mr. Brooks. Dr. Hawkins, do you want to weigh in? Uh, yes, I appreciate it, the board members' comments, and thank you very much, Mr. Schick. My question is to Mr. Bone. Uh, Mr. Bone, could you tell us about how things will sequence relative to uh, final approval of our um, bill. What's the time frame uh, that we'd anticipate? Yeah, yeah, no, uh, great question, doctor. And you know, next steps. So um, the bill is set for a hearing in the Assembly Business and Professions Committee on uh, Tuesday, July 11. So um, not too distant future. Um, and, um, you know, anticipate that there will be, you know, future amendments and, um, you know, other changes that the Senate approved the bill, uh, on a 32 to 1 vote, um, with respect to the, the version that the, you know, the board saw, um, uh, and took a position on before and, um, 
so now the assembly kind of has their you know their bite of the apple so to speak so I, I i do expect more changes to you know to be made um and you know the board has put out you know um you know in its position that we took last board meeting you know suggested changes uh that would get the board to a support position so you know having conversations and dialogue with you know variety of folks you know on those after that then they will go to another committee hearing um after the summer recess so they take a month off uh from the middle of july to the middle of august <clears throat> then they'll come back and um there'll be a vote in the assembly appropriations committee and then a floor vote <clears throat> and then another vote in the senate and then down to the governor's office so um the board at its sub next meeting on august 24 and 25 will you know will update the board again on where on where things are and uh hopefully it will be in a you know in a good shape in a position where you know if the board is comfortable to support the bill then we'll be able to get there that's my hope so when might they get to the governor's office then with whatever changes or amendments occur? What are you thinking about? Uh, yeah, the approved, whatever version the, the legislature approves would go down to the governor's office uh, around the middle of September. <clears throat> um, the governor then will have 30 days. So we may not know the governor's final decision on that until uh, the middle of October. I'm going to say October 15th or so, but I don't have that calendar in front of me, so please don't hold me to that. Thank you very much for that. Other comments or questions from board members? Dr. Helzer. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Bull, I'm wondering if there's been any addition, any response to our recommendation to um, use a different approach to changing the board's composition to create a public member majority um, by uh, converting one member as opposed to adding two members as currently in the bill. Um, you know, not in specific to the board's proposed approach um you know i know the 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 senate approved that that was a that was a, a, at least their version right of adding two that was approved you know again overwhelmingly by 32 to one vote um i i think it's very well known where the board is on on that matter um and so i think it's really up to the legislature as to you know where are they going to settle on this um, we did sponsor a bill, as in, I, I'm sure you're aware, Dr. Reno and other me members, we sponsored a bill last year with our preferred approach. So uh, I think there's certainly no lack of awareness uh, amongst the key stakeholders about where the board is on that. Thank you. Welcome. Other comments or questions about our sunset bill? Madam Chair, I had a question about item 15 on the, the that is the change in the um, evidentiary standard. Sure. So, uh, again, this this relates to uh, my um, well. I think this is going to impact our attorney general's cost if this passes, um, where the burden of proof changes from clear and convincing evidence to preponderance of evidence. There's going to be a significant increase in cost. I I'm not arguing. You know, I I voted against this change. Uh, I know the board overwhelmingly, uh, uh, or no, I shouldn't say overwhelmingly, but there certainly was a majority of the board that voted in favor of that. Of that, uh, I I did not. And my, I, I would just like to state my concern about this item again um, is that this burden of proof thing is, is a is a, you know, not only are we changing the composition of the board, um, but we are in fact. Um, changing the 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 ease with which a doctor's license to practice can be removed, and I think that's a very very serious um, problem. There's a reason why the evidentiary standard has been clear and convincing for many years, and that's because it is a very it's it's it is not trivial um to take a doctor's license away now that doctor needs to respect that as well i certainly agree with that but i i am concerned about this change from clear and convincing to preponderance of evidence and um for me that is a huge uh obstacle to vote 
for this. Um, I, I'm in favor of the, all the other things. This is the one thing that I am not in favor of. So I would just state that. Uh, and I do think it's going to have an impact on the attorney general's cost because if, in fact, it lowers the standard, there are going to be more cases to try. Thanks, or, Dr. Thorpe. Not to try, but to discipline. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Thorpe. Other comments, questions? All right, I'm not seeing any, but for some reason I can't. Awesome. Yes, Ms. Webb. Just to clarify what what's currently in the bill on uh, burden of proof, um, it, it's it's not what the board voted for, but what is in there is a bifurcated burden of proof. And so to revoke a license, it still requires proof by clear and convincing evidence. Uh, again, that's not what the board asked for, but that's what is in there currently. I just wanted to clarify that with Dr. Thorpe. Great. Thank you for that clarification. Any further comments or questions? All right. Are we moving on now to AB 1070 and then we'll take public comment or are we taking it as we go? I, I, mean, I think our, our norm is to take it, take it as we go. Okay. We'll take it as we go. Sean, could you open it up for public comment? I have a Q and A window and handwriting feature enabled for anyone wishing to make a public comment. Just go ahead and uh, type anything in that Q and A box or raise your hand and we'll call on you the order we see it come in. First up here, we have Eric Anders. Eric, you should be receiving that prompt. Come on, Eric. Looks like your line's open. Are you there? I'm here. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, it's shocking sometimes the things that Richard Thorpe says with his CMA propaganda. It should be easy to take away a bad doctor's license when it's so freaking easy for them to harm and kill patients and get away with it with this board. This board has a dismal 4% disciplinary rate. That's not proof that it's easy to take away a doctor's license. This board is here to protect the people of this state. It's not to protect doctors. It's not to make it easy for them to pay their license fees. It's not there to protect them from getting their license taken away. It's there to protect the people of this state from dangerous doctors that are out there harming and killing people. My partner of 39 years was just killed because of another negligent doctor. That's four times in my lifetime that I have been affected by doctors. My mother was killed. My sister was killed. I've had three failed hernia surgeries and now my partner is dead from a, a bad doctor. Yes, it should be very easy to take away their licenses if we can prove that they did wrong. Shame on you, Richard Thorpe, and your CMA propaganda. Christina said that the board has faced significant lawsuits this year, more so than in other years. I've asked before why the costs of these lawsuits aren't specifically pointed out in the annual report. I've asked where the money comes from to pay to defend the medical board. If those costs are specifically being shown in the annual report, but no one seems to ever want to reply. And in turn, it never shows up in the annual report as a line item. These costs are extremely important for the public to know how much is being spent to defend accusations against the board. These costs are crucial to know when justifying doctors having higher fees, if they're covering the costs for the board to defend itself in lawsuits especially if it's over activities that the board is found wrong on. This board should not be defending itself for doing things wrong. It's been in existence for over a century. You should have gotten it all right by now. You shouldn't be being sued for this stuff and you should have a better track record at protecting the public. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up here, we have Tracy Dominguez. Tracy, let me go ahead and send you that request. Tracy, it looks like, yeah, we can hear you. Tracy, please oh, go okay. ahead. Hi, I'm Tracy Dominguez, and I am from Bakersfield and a volunteer with Consumer Watchdog. 
I have been through the entire process with, with a complaint from my daughter while getting nowhere with a complaint from my grandson. I understand firsthand how difficult the enforcement process is and how one sided it is favored of the physicians because I have been through it. I have had to fight every step. I, have, I was fighting for the right to, for safe care, not for only for my daughter and my grandson, but for other countless mothers and babies that have been harmed. These changes in this bill would have helped me with my daughter's complaint and would have given me the opportunity to fight for the right for my grandson who has, has had his own complaint reviewed. The patient impact statement means a lot to me because my complaint reached the point of the process where I would have had the opportunity to provide one. My doctor was scheduled for the ALG hearing when I was subpoenaed to be the witness, but just a month before the hearing, the DAG convinced him to settle based on the supposed retirement or health reasons. After struggling to speak to the staff, I tried to give my information to the staff for my complaint and getting nowhere. I was finally going to get the opportunity to provide the evidence that had proven that the doctor had lied to this board. But the hearing was canceled and my opportunity to speak was gone. We need the patient impact statement, the opportunity with no restrictions. Please do not adopt the staff's recommendation for our statement should be subject to discovery. The physician and the lawyers have had every opportunity to analyze and rewrite the cause of our family's death and harm. Please give us a voice to have our state say and provide unchallenged and restricted patient impact statements. I require um, the required interview before quality of care complaint is closed. It is so important. I agree with the staff recommending the changes and lowering the burden across the board is also very necessary. If the board had done this or voted on to do this, my daughter would be alive. I still hold this board accountable for my daughter's death and my grandson's for not protecting her from dangerous doctors. This board, this complaint should be lowered. This components of evidence should be lowered. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up here we have Alka Ari. Alka, let me go ahead and send you that request. Alka, it looks like your line's open. Are you there? I am. Can you hear me? We can, yeah. Please go ahead. Okay, perfect. Good morning. My name is Alka Eri, and I'm from San Francisco. I'm a volunteer patient advocate with Consumer Watchdog. I'd like to express support for SB 815. My older sister, Shulpa, died from medical negligence at age 47. An anesthesia error destroyed her lungs to the point of requiring a lung transplant, but she didn't survive. Our family turned to the medical board when California law prevented us from seeking justice through the courts. But that door quickly closed too. After a few weeks, our complaint was dismissed without action. There were no interviews of us or any physicians. Our evidence outside of the medical record was also refused. The Department of Public Health referred our complaint about the hospital and its employees to the medical board, but that too was seemingly ignored. My experience with the medical board proves complaints are not thoroughly investigated. The medical board dismisses approximately 9,000 complaints out of 10,000 each year without any action. They're dismissed without any interviews and based solely on review of records produced and filtered by the accused physician or affiliated hospital. For those few complaints that move forward in the process, investigations are fraught with bias and lack of transparency. Deals are cut to preserve physician livelihoods with little regard to the patient lives lost or harmed. Few physicians are ever disciplined, leading to a climate in California where there are no perceived consequences for violating the medical standard of care. I support SB 815 because it improves the medical board's accountability to the public by requiring interviews before a complaint is closed. It gives the medical board a public board member majority and the funding it needs to stay in business. We need SB 815 to keep the medical board operational and to enhance patient involvement with the enforcement process. This bill would have made a difference for my family and to my sister's memory. While SB 815 doesn't offer every improvement I would have liked to see, it finds common ground amongst a majority of stakeholders and helps us all move together in the spirit of patient safety. 
Regarding the patient impact statement, I have some concerns about requiring legal review and physician discovery in advance. I can understand why legal review might be needed to ensure confidential information isn't publicly shared, but is there a legal review of any physician statements? Are any physician statements shared with patients in advance? If anything, the enforcement process is essentially closed to injured patients and their families, and the patient impact statement is our only chance to share our story in our own words, to speak directly to a physician and share how their preventable error robbed their patient and their family of their ability to live the life they wanted and pursue their dreams. Restricting patient impact statements creates one standard for patients and another for physicians, and it's hardly equitable. What is the harm in giving patients one opportunity to speak freely from their heart compared to the lifelong harm patients endure as a result of negligent physicians? Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, next up here, we have Maria Ambara Navaturet. Or never, sorry, Maria should be receiving a prompt there on your end. Good morning. Good morning, we can hear you. Please go ahead. I am Maria Ibarra Navaret. I am from San Jose, a volunteer with Consumers Watchdog. Today would have been my little brother's 31st birthday. He should be blowing his candles on his cake. Instead, I am here at a medical board meeting discussing a sunset bill. By choosing to honor my brother fighting for rights that should have been at him for it given to him as a patient and I should have had as a complainant. My brother died of a medication error. A code sepsis was called, but the sepsis protocol was not implemented immediately, nor was the treatment. With cognitive disability, my brother required bedside support from a person for informed consent, but I was never informed that he was at the ER until he had died and was at the coroner's office. When staff came back to see him, he was gone. They had no idea where he was. He was eventually found on the restroom floor, not breathing and no pulse. While trying to resuscitate my brother, the doctor gave him a medication that was a contraindicated to a medication that my brother had been prescribed for years. The medication had the exact opposite effect, which would have caused a periodical decrease in his blood pressure and pulse. My brother died tragically at 29 years old. I keep coming to these meetings and testifying before you because these changes should have been made long ago before my brother's death. We support the required interview before our quality of care complaints are closed. We support staff's recommendation to make the changes needed to ensure that a required interview takes place before a complaint is closed and does not interfere with those complaints that reach the, the field. We support a public board member majority and the lower burden of proof. The lower burden of proof will ensure that more of our complaints go through investigation. My concern is with the staff recommendations for the change to the patient impact statement. Physicians have a due processes throughout the entire enforcement processes. Why should my patient impact statement be open to be challenged by the physician's attorney? We ask for more input into the enforcement processes, which includes the required interview and our impact statement. We don't get to challenge the physician's statement. Therefore, the physician's attorney should not have the right to challenge ours. Where are the checks and balances and equality here? Thank 30 you. Seconds, oh, thank you for your public comment. And next up here, we're going to go to Kimberly Turbin. Kimberly, let me go ahead and send you that request. Here in the list. There you go, Kimberly. Should be receiving a prompt on your end. Good morning, Kimberly. Looks like your line's open. Hi. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Please go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, my name is Kimberly Turpin. I'm from Los Angeles, and I'm a volunteer with Consumer Watchdog. I'm here today to ensure that our steps to consume consumers' um, input into the enforcement process remains in the bill. When I suffered lifelong harm during the delivery of my son, I filed a complaint with this board. I had little to no input into the enforcement process. I did not get the opportunity to issue a patient impact statement to the board to ensure that my voice would be heard and the impact of that harm I still suffer from today it would have been reflected in the report. 
that you guys received. I want other women and families to have the input that I never had. I support a lowering of the burden of proof across the board. I support that staff recommendations to specify that the standard of proof to deny license is preponderance of the evidence. I support the change to specify that the standard of proof to revoke probation is preponderance of the evidence. I also support our efforts to increase the patient and family's input into the enforcement process. I support the required interview as we originally asked for. The required interview should occur before quality of care complaints are closed. My concern is with the staff suggestion change to the patient impact statement. We are finally getting a voice in the process and I do not want our voices silenced. Recommending that our patient impact statement should be open to discovery by our doctor's lawyers is taking away our voice. Our doctors have due process through every single um, step and aspect of the enforcement process. Our patient impact statement would only be provided once our complaints have been reviewed, analyzed, investigated, and passed the review of a medical consultant and a medical expert. Our complaints will already be vetted by all of the above, including our doctor and doctor's lawyers. Please, please remove the recommendation that our statement should be subject to discovery. You are finally agreeing that we, the victims, should have a voice. Don't take a step back and silence us now. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next in queue here, we have Michelle Montserrat Ramos. Michelle, give me a second to send you that request. You'd be receiving that on your end. morning. I am Michelle Montserrat Ramos and I am with Consumer Watchdog. We appreciate the board's willingness to listen to us and include many of the priorities that our team has advocated for. We support a public board member majority. We supported this issue during the last sunset review and worked to support it when it was the subject of AB 2060. All that we ask is that you take the clearest path possible to change the composition of the board. If you move forward with the staff's recommendation, we ask that you change one of the physician member vacancies to a public member vacancy and encourage the governor to make it a priority to fill the now two public member vacancies in order to acquire the public member majority. As you know, the required interview for quality of care complaints is an issue that I brought to the board many years ago, and it's an issue that we have pushed for. We agree with and support the staff's recommendation because it will adhere to our original request. This issue is very personal for me because my late husband to be Lloyd's complaint was dismissed at the central complaint unit with no review, no review by a medical consultant, and no input from me. This has been an issue that has haunted me for years and I know will leave many affected Californians feeling like they had finally had input into this process, giving them an opportunity to offer information and respond to questions that they would not have had the opportunity to do before. We support lowering the burden of proof change across the board. We believe that lowering the burden of proof will allow more Californians to have their complaints reviewed and investigated. The closer we can get to changing the burden of proof for all complaints, the closer we will get to stopping egregious harm in instances of repeat offenders. Our family members' lives and deaths are not trivial. As you have heard from other members of my team, we have a concern with the staff's recommendation for amending the patient impact statement. In the past, the board has always compared our complaints to the court process. Well, in court cases, especially criminal cases, the victim impact statement is not challenged. It is not open for review by the opposing attorney. As you know, with over 95% of complaints closed without any action, few Californians will get the opportunity to offer a patient impact statement. As you know, the few complaints that do make the process to an accusation are reviewed, analyzed, investigated, with many opportunities by the licensee and their counsel to question and refrain the process of events that led to needless death and harm. Please give Californians the voice that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next up here we have Marion Hollingsworth. Marion, you should be receiving that prompt on your end. 
morning, Mary. Looks like your line's open. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Please okay, go ahead. Thank you. Hello, my name is Marion Hollingsworth, patient safety advocate. I want to second previous comments that include CMA preference and the low disciplinary numbers. Less than 2% of disciplines are given probation. Reprimands for even egregious cases are becoming more common. The board should do whatever it can to protect patients and not doctors. I support SB 815 and its requirement for a preponderance of evidence over clear and convincing. I also endorse more con the, more, the idea for more consumer involvement in the investigative process. If you had listened to me about a doctor who contributed to my father's death, it might have prevented the death of another patient immediately after my appeal. If you if you need to believe you need to believe consumers as much as you believe doctors put consumers on an equal footing when you do your investigations. SB 815, while not perfect, provides more changes that protect the public than any other sunset in recent memory. Please back the changes and endorse SB 815. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you for your public comment at this time. I lost them. There are no additional requests in queue. Uh, thank you. We'll bring it back to the board. Are there any further comments from board members on SB 815 and staff's recommendation? Uh, again, is no change in position, so there's no action for us to take. Uh, Dr. Hawkins, I see your hand. Yeah, just a quick question to uh, Ms. Webb. Uh, there's just a recommendation about that. I don't know if it's even possible replacement of two physician vacancies with public members. I think there is a requirement of a certain composition of the board, and I assume that since we support this recommendation of a public majority, it takes into account that composition. Can you comment on that? The the language that the board proposed makes a change to the uh, composition, and it just, like you said, Dr. Hawkins flips one position or physician posi position to a public member position and it also addresses the makeup of the disciplinary panels the current language in the bill uh, would not make a change to the disciplinary panels which requires a physician majority so thank you need the recommended change any other board mark Excuse me, board member comments or questions before we move on to AB 1070. All right, seeing none, Mr. Bone, the floor is yours again. Thank you, Madam President. Um, the board currently has an opposed position on AB 1070. And again, we're on item, this is 4E. At the time the position was adopted, the bill allowed physicians to supervise an unlimited number of physician assistants or PAs while those PAs are performing home health evaluations. During our prior board meeting, the board expressed concerns over the language of what constituted a home health evaluation. Also, there was sentiment that if there was an unlimited number of PAs to who could be supervised, at one by a single physician that the quality of supervision would be significantly degraded. I will do a screen share in a moment um, so we can walk through the amendments. So bear with me, please. And the, unfortunately, because the bill was amended last night, um, <clears throat> didn't have the time to update uh, this and get a, a proper analysis out to you all. So appreciate your patience. Uh, hope everything is visible, sufficiently visible on my screen. See head nods, great. So the first change there here that we see here in in it, blue after we you know show this this strikeout, but I'll just bear with me, is that the physician can supervise up to but no more than eight PAs at one time provided they do they are doing the following the physicians the pas in question are focused solely on performing these home health evaluations and they're doing so solely for the following purposes first gathering patient information performing an annual wellness visit and you can see the stricken out language or health evaluation if it does not involve direct patient treatment <clears throat> or prescri prescribing medication. 
and I'll just note uh, at the prior board meeting, there was question about what constituted an advanced assessment, uh, possibly diagnostic screenings as well, but there's definitely a narrowing of the allowable activities here. The PA who performs these evaluations remains subject to all supervis supervisory, supervisory, excuse me, and scope requirements. Um, so, you know, again, they're going to be bound by their practice agreement. And then the bill defines further the two terms of annual wellness visit and health evaluation. So those are defined as uh, in-home health evaluation, a comprehensive physical exam, assessment of current and prior health conditions, a complete medication review, screening tests, health education, and assessment of social determinants of health. And then an annual wellness visit is a preventative visit with correlating current procedural terminology codes performed annually to a patient to be used for the purposes of diagnosing patient conditions during the annual wellness visit, which may include non-physical examination for patients covered by Medicare Part D for more than 12 months. I believe the Medicare language there, uh, as we saw in the prior discussion, that, that seems to relate to the business model of the sponsor of the bill, Signify Health. Um, they seem to be very active in this space. Um, but anyway, so there's the changes, you know, members. I, I mean, I think it's definitely a narrowing of the scope. Um, don't know that it will completely address the, you know, the views of the and the concerns of the board. Um, you know, if it does, and the will of the board is, hey, this is this is much better and acceptable than, um, you know, moving to a neutral position, then I believe would be appropriate. Um, thank you for your patience with this last minute change, members, and happy to answer any questions. Do board members have any questions, Dr. Hawkins? I see your hand first. Thank you. Yeah, so I don't know if it, uh, so my, my question is Medicare encourages physicians to perform an annual wellness examination. It's a comprehensive examination, including EKGs, certain inquiries. And because it's important enough, they give a premium on compensation. My question is whether if this is done by a, a mid level physician assistant, does that prevent the physician from performing the same service that Medicare encourages? Uh, don't know the answer to that, doctor. Um, uh, unfortunately, the the language that we're all looking at is all the information that that I have uh, doesn't seem to be preventative of a physician following up and then providing doing their own di diagnostics. Um, clarification: the the Medicare is a, it's a specific defined entity. This annual physical examination, wellness, so that it's something very very specific. But you wouldn't know that. But I'm just saying that's that a question required. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Dr. Thorpe, and then I saw Dr. Mulu's hand as well. So, Dr. Thorpe, uh, you're well, first. this is understand. I, I, in my experience, because I, I work in practices where where we have physicians and mid levels, uh, you know, taking care of patients, uh, and I'm sure I know Dr. Hawkins does too. But the the point is, I believe that Medicare will only pay for an annual wellness visit one time. It doesn't matter who does it. I mean, I, I mean, it, it, I, I don't mean it doesn't matter who does it, but it will only pay that fee one time per calendar year, regardless of who does the visit. And uh, so, to answer his Dr. Hawkins' question, I think if if someone did this at home health, it would prevent. I mean, wouldn't prevent it from from a doctor from doing it, but he wouldn't get paid for it. The Medicare reimbursement wouldn't be there. Yeah. yeah. Correct. Thank you, Dr. Thorpe. Um, I did have another question, Madam Chair. But Dr. Mo could go first. No, go why you finish up your Well, my my only I mean I think this is better. Um I think it, it is a, a much more um appropriate limitation. Um I always worry when some uh uh commercial entity is trying to um, improve the language of of, uh, of laws. Uh, clearly, this is for their own benefit, and um, it's not necessarily for the, for the good of the community. I'm not, 
I'm not saying it couldn't be helpful, but this is a better version of, the, of what we saw before. Thanks, Dr. Thorpe. Dr. Mahmood? Yeah, so my concern on this is they're allowing now eight to supervise eight physician assistant. Is there any limit on how many patients they can see? They can actually squeeze more patients, just eight physician assistant, but then 16 physician assistant. There should be number of patients they can see a day so that supervising physician can actually effectively and efficiently supervise them. So is there any limit on those physician assistant, how many patients they can see? I mean, they might be seeing 50 patients a day that would not be able to be supervised by one physician. So and I don't know if we have any leverage on that to ask them to accommodate that. Uh, that uh, great question, Dr. Ramu. That's not in the bill. The, um, there's no limitation on the number of patients that can be seen uh, in, in a given time period. That's a big and we can, concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we can ask for whatever, you know, whatever the will of the board is, you know, we can, you know, we can ask for. Uh, other board member comments or questions? I, I will uh, admit I'm not hearing a groundswell of support for changing our position from the current opposed position we have, but if someone would like to speak up in that regard. Yeah, I would say we don't have the real specification about all these things. We should stay up for us. Fair enough. Uh, and that's our current position. Mm -hmm. yes. Should we open it up for public comments and um, see if there are any, and then we can bring it back to the board for Let's ultimate see. determination about what to do? Sean, if you could open the public comment lineup. Any yeah, hand raising features in the QA window open? Anyone wish to make a public comment? And raise your hand or. Uh... Type something into that Q and A window and get you called upon. Any call in users, you can press star three to toggle raising your hand as well. Give everyone a few seconds here to see if anyone queues up. In present, also, I'm not seeing any requests. Okay, uh, we'll bring it back to the board. So, um, I mean, now would be the time for any board member to speak up if they feel strongly that we should change our position. Uh, if not, it will continue to remain as opposed. Uh, Mr. Bone has the feedback from this conversation. Yeah. May I ask a uh, just a clarifying question on that, Madam President? So I, I have the because the, the the advocates will want to know why the board is remaining in the post position. So um, I have Dr. Mahmood's comment about patient volume, the concern that there's a, an unlimited number of patients that can be seen by PAs under this model and that there ought to be some limit in place. It, does the board have a limit that they wish to suggest? That may be an expected question, follow-up question that I get. Real, realistically, if they're seeing patients in the home, going from one home to another, um, the, so there are, there are a couple of scenarios. There's that, that scenario where people are getting services in their own home and then there are residential care facilities where um, multiple people are living at the same basic address in, in multiple apartments in that same place. So um, I think realistically, um, you know, 18 patients a day would be, that, that would be a, a, a big lift for anybody um, I, I, I don't, personally, I don't think they should probably be able to see any more than 15 in a day. Per PA, per day. Per PA, right. But that's, you know, I don't have any statistics on that. It's just my, my gestalt on that. Dr. Balad, I see your hand. Uh, I think you may be on mute. I can't hear you. I am on mute. Thank you. Um. So a couple of things, you know, I, I think I want to go back to what Dr. Mahmood said, and I'll go back to kind of experience. If this, be, this, if this, and I think the concern, I'm not going to speak for everybody on the board, but I'll speak about my concern. Whenever I think about opportunities for billing, uh, my first concern, my first ask would be, are you using, what codes are you planning on using? What are the diagnostics that you're going to be uh 
using because I've seen different models where all of a sudden people are getting a lot of duplex ultrasounds and they're getting just all kinds of things, right? So what's the scope? And if it's truly an annual wellness visit, uh, some G code, and if it's going to, um, you know, uh, will the patients know that, uh, no, I'm not going to go get my annual with my physician or nurse practitioner, but this takes supplements it. I think that's how does the patient know, because it's very challenging for patients to know what happens in healthcare, I think, and how complicated our healthcare ecosystem is. Thirdly, as far as the, uh, the, the volume, you know, we've all talked about this over the years and our, uh, understand what churning means, right? We can do something. Can you do an annual wellness visit in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 25 minutes, or 30 minutes? So if you look at the requirements for an annual wellness visit, now it could take a good 30 minutes because you're projecting the journey for the next future five years of that patient. And so I'd like to know what kind of documentation and how much time because travel time, depending on what area you're in, and if you're committing 30 minutes per patient, I couldn't possibly see how anybody could get to 15. So unless they're gonna be working 12 hour days. And so I think the one thing I would just say to my colleagues on the board, I mean, I think we're all for expanding services uh, to meet people in their place and to help them. But this bill for me as written, I, I'm, not, I'm not ready to support it. Thanks Dr. Bullock. Other comments or questions? Um, it, I, Dr. Mahmood? Yeah. yeah, so coming on the number of patients, uh, we just need to see what is the capacity because our basic and ultimate responsibility and duty is to save Californian for the protection and well-being of Californians. And we need to figure out how many patients, even the physician, reviews 25% of the cases the physician assistants see. And if there are even 15 patients, 120 will be asking physician to review 30 cases where he is seeing himself or his own 30 patients, how it's going to be uh, possible. So I really think that uh, they need to come up with their thing that specify exactly what they will be doing, how many patients, uh, how often this will be happening and how the review process is going to be, because I think the monitoring and following up and scrutinizing these physicians who are seeing that large number of patients is very important. And this is directly related to, besides any billing, besides that monitoring thing, this is directly related to, and many of those patients might have multiple problems on a heart, kidney, lung, liver, other things. And that's why they cannot come out of the house. That is one of the major reasons those patients cannot come and their intensity is going to be higher. So we really need, need to be very cautious on this thing. And in present form, I strongly oppose this. Thank you. Mr. Bone, do you, you have what you need? I, I think so, Madam President. I appreciate the, all the comments um, from, from the members. So we will submit an updated position letter that remains, that indicates the board remains in oppose. Um, and we'll we'll add in some of the, the context and comments and flavor that I that I got from the discussion. So um, that Great. is appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we'll now move on to uh, SB 357, correct? Yes. Let me stop my screen share. SB 357 is a, a brand new bill to the members. Um, it establishes a permissive pathway for a physician to report to the Department of Motor Vehicles that a patient has a condition that could affect their safe operation of a motor vehicle. This would replace the current law that requires a physician to make similar reports for, for the patients who have a disorder characterized by lapses of consciousness. Proponents of the bill believe that the current law treats unfairly those who have certain conditions, such as epilepsy. Further, they argue that current law discourages patients from being transparent with their physicians about their symptoms, as they would, understandably, fear losing their driving privileges. Staff do not have concerns about the main goal of the bill. We do, however, wish to address the language that would shield a physician from disciplinary or licensing action from the board in relation to making or not making these reports. 
we find these disciplinary shields to be unnecessary and counterproductive. And if a licensee were to act in an unprofessional manner relating to these reports, the board would be unable to act. As we find the underlying policy of the bill to be appropriate, we recommend the board adopt a supportive amended position to seek inclusion of the proposed amendments to the bill. And those are noted on the top, excuse me, bottom of page three and top of page four of the analysis. Happy to answer any questions, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Bone. Are there any questions or comments? Dr. Hawkins? So, Mr. Bone, um, what does the staff believe that the main goal of this bill is? Because to me, it seems like it's lessening the requirement of potentially reporting uh, to the DMV an individual who may, in addition to themselves, put the, the general public on the highways at risk. So it's a less thing, unless I misunderstood something. Um, it's a, maybe a bit of both, I suppose, doctor. So the current law speaks to lapses of consciousness, which I think are not entirely inclusive of all of the different ranges of um, conditions, right? That may affect your ability to, to drive safely. Right. So there's that, that, you know, they're, they're trying to, they're trying to address. Um, I, I, I hope that we'll have somebody from the, the sponsor's office, which is the Epilepsy Foundation of Los Angeles, on the phone. Um, I, I understand there is a, you know, again, this unfair treatment, um, especially if you have, I believe you can have, if your epilepsy or other similar condition is well controlled, then you can drive safely. You can. Um, and so, therefore, it's kind of the broadening out that... Um, that they're trying to address. And then as well, that if I'm a patient um, and you know, man, I, I really need my car to get to work, to support my family and myself, I, I, you know, they believe the current law is uh, inhibiting that really important transparency, right? Between the physician and the patient and could be preventing hurdle, you know, putting a hurdle up in the way of them, you know, getting uh, appropriate care. So there's definitely some, you know, I, I, I hear you, doctor. There's definitely some kind of competing, you know, um, public priority priorities there. Um, but that's what I gathered from them. And so by making this to be a permissive approach that um, it will encourage, um, you know, doctors to continue to exercise their judgment as we, you know, we rely upon them, right, to do so. Um, but hopefully it will encourage more, you know, open communication between, you know, their patient and them. Um, so that's the broad that's the broad goal, as in, then it pertains to the liability language um, that's in there. It, it's very broad, very sweeping. Talk, you know, civil liability, criminal liability is in there, and that's in current law right now. There's under current law a, a civil and criminal liability protection, but as proposed in the bill right now, it, it really broadens that out to also include matters pertaining to um, unprofessional conduct. And that's where the staff, um, we, we raise those concerns that are in the analysis. Okay, thank you very much. And I think that the, uh, for clarity, if a person has a episode where they lose consciousness related to a cardiac condition or epilepsy, they get their work up and they're not limited and their conditions are controlled, they won't be limited to actually drive. They'll still be able to drive. But the initial, I mean, part of the important hook is the person who, Reports that happens twice, but they don't want to cooperate <laughs> with the evaluation to get this condition diagnosed and treated so that they're safe as well as the other folks on the road are safe. That's the only comment about that. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Hawkins. Uh, Mr. Brooks. So, as I read this bill, it sounds like it's a very narrow, tailored bill for a solution of a very small minority of individuals that fit, fit this program. Is that correct? I mean, is... Uh, I, well, I don't, I don't know necessarily, Mr. Brooks, uh, the, the universe of people that we're, that are, we're dealing with here. I mean, the, you know, for example, according to, it's in the analysis, according to the, you know, to the office office, there's 400 plus thousand Californians who have a epilepsy diagnosis. Um, and, you know, so that that alone 
there's potentially a pretty large group of people that that may be um, encapsulated by the bill. Is that answering your question, sir? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, it's just that's fine. Thank you. Answers my question. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, doctor. Yeah. So there is little thing. I I, I definitely agree that if somebody, as Dr. Hawkins said, somebody has a couple of episodes of seizures or has an diagnosis of epilepsy, it is really in the best interest of him and his family, and actually mostly for the public who is on the road. But there are certain things in which uh, patients can have seizure, like sometimes patient can have a situation where the electrolytes can go totally deranged and have a seizure, and we put them into this thing the rest of their life because that might happen only once in their lifetime. Now somebody has a consistent problem, a different story. So we should make a differentiation on that Otherwise, definitely anybody who had two seizure episodes, they should be observed for a long time, at least for like, I would say three to five years before a neurologist can clear that, okay, he's safely doing effectively and can do that. Otherwise, that thing should not be on the road. But other secondary causes which are causing seizure very rarely, um, they should be also looked into that and uh, a specialist should be involved in that before reporting, before taking somebody's complete liberty to drive away. Uh, but uh, as I said, that somebody has a definite diagnosis of seizures should be off the road driving himself. Great. Thank you, Doctor. Additional comments, questions? Uh, Madam Chair, this is Dr. Thorpe. I guess my, my only, my only uh, concern, I, I agree with, with, um, uh, Dr. Hawkins' uh, uh, concern about about this. I mean, um, this is this is. I, I think uh, making this a permissive um, reporting compared to a um, a required reporting. I mean, honestly, this is a very difficult problem to deal with, and it's it it does come many times. It it creates tension between the. The practitioner, the clinician, and their and their patient, because you have to say no, you can't drive, and and many of them either are the sole provider of transportation for their family, or they need to transport to work, and and many times we have to put them on treatment for a period of time, um, and it's not it's not a week; it's usually at least. 60 days uh, to make sure that they're not having any any breakthrough seizures. I mean, sometimes it's more than that. So it it can be very, um, I'm sure, frustrating for the person who develops this disorder. But in terms of protecting patients and and the drivers of California that are on the road with them, um, hypoglycemia is another a, another cause of of this thing. Um, I can tell you, you know, my my father was driving north on inter on 395 a number of years ago, and a woman passed out, crossed the center line, and hit him head on, doing 60 miles an hour. He was, you know, drive fortunately driving a car that had an airbag, which saved his life, but he had multiple injuries as a result of this, and the woman died. She had a baby in the back seat, fortunately, that lived, but the woman herself died, and she had a in this case, it was hypoglycemia. So the idea of of men or yes, it's unlikely that people have more accidents. But the part of the reason they don't have any more accidents is because we restrict them for a period of time. So we we don't put them back on the road till they're judged to be safe to drive. So I would be opposed, um, or I would be I, I mean, it certainly needs to be amended. And so, if you want to say supportive amended, fine, but I would not be in favor of a permissive approach to this. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Thorpe. Should we open this up for public comment? All right, let's do that. Sean? Yes, the hand raising feature in the QA window open for anyone wishing to make a public comment. Also, if you're in a call line, you can press star three. Uh, the first 
request here we have is for Rebecca Hallowell, it looks like. Rebecca, you should be receiving that prompt on your end. Uh, Rebecca Hollowell from the Epilepsy Foundation Los Angeles. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to share, um, you know, our intent to the bill. Uh, you know, we're advocates for people with epilepsy. So, um, a couple of things I just from the top want to address that you have all discussed. So, actually, mandatory reporting does not make our roads any safer. So, actually, California is one of six states in the country that has mandatory reporting of the lapse of consciousness. So any lapse of consciousness, any lapse of consciousness can be reported to that local public health agency, then reported to DMV. It's a process that can take weeks to months uh, to get their license back. So again, going back to the safe, public safety, we absolutely support public safety. And that's why this, this bill would not change the doctor's ability to report. What we want is doctors to have the discretion to not report when it isn't warranted. Um, so, you know, people can achieve, I mean, thank God today we have so many more therapies and treatments for people with epilepsy and to talk just about population. So 1 in 26 will have a, will have epilepsy their lifetime. 1 in 10 will have a seizure. And uh, there's so many different types of treatments and therapies now in, in 2023 that in 1957, when, uh, this whole law came about, um, but. You know, we have 70% of that 425,000 people in epilepsy who can achieve seizure control through medication. And uh, those folks who have seizure control can have that breakthrough seizure and it could actually be out of their control. They could have walked up to the pharmacy and the pharmacy is giving them the wrong medication or their insurance company is denying them the right, the right uh, medication that the doctor is prescribing. So for those folks who have control and have that breakthrough seizure, uh, they're scared of losing their license. You guys talked about losing livelihood, and I so appreciate that you guys acknowledge that. So what's happening in our community is people are not disclosing to their doctors when they have that change in seizure frequency, and they're not able to chat with their doctor, and the doctor's not able to say, okay, why did you have that break breakthrough seizure? Let's figure this out. Let's get this rectified. And so, as you guys probably know very well, as um, you know, Uncontrolled seizures can be super dangerous. Uh, they lead to injury and death. And so ultimately what we want is to protect the doctor and patient relationship and allow for our community to be forthcoming, to get that treatment, to get better, to get past that break. So I just wanna thank you again for your time. And again, just this will not do away with the existing process. It's just going to allow doctors to not report and utilize their discretion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your public comment. We'll check in here, President Lawson. Uh, that was the only request. Oh, no, sorry. We have uh, Lucas Evans in here just popped in. Lucas, you should be receiving that prompt. Morning, Lucas, are you there? Looks like your line's open, Lucas, if you have a mute on your your headset or anything like that, it could be why you're not coming through. He said he's switching the phone here. We'll give you a few seconds here, Lucas. Try setting the prompt again. If you're calling in on another line, Lucas, you'll have to hit star three. On, okay, there, I just saw you switch to phone. Send you the prompt one more time. You should be able to meet from your computer. Uh, hello, can you hear me? We can, Lucas. There you go. Please go ahead. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, so my name is Lucas Evanson, speaking on behalf of the California Medical Association. CMA supports SB 357. This bill seeks to remove outdated language from the vehicle code that discriminates against specific conditions, including epilepsy, and to protect the patient-physician relationship by giving physicians greater discretion when reporting patients to the DMV. An outdated law from 1957 discriminates against drivers with epilepsy and other conditions by requiring physicians to automatically report these drivers to the DMV. 
Research has shown that these requirements can result in patients withholding crucial information from their physicians and not seeking the care that they need out of a fear of losing their licenses. When a person with epilepsy withholds such critical information from their doctor, they jeopardize their own health, risking an increase in seizure activity or even a loss of seizure control. By refining the circumstances under which physicians are required to report patients, SB 357 seeks to maintain appropriate public safety standards without jeopardizing patient health for individuals with epilepsy and other conditions. Uh, we appreciate you providing the opportunity for public comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, there's a loss of no additional requests in queue. Thank you. We'll bring it back to the board. I see Dr. Balot's hand. Um, I would like us to focus our comments on whether or not we um, agree with our staff's recommendation that we should have a support if amended position and their recommended amendments uh, are in our board packets. Dr. Balot? Yes, I want to just mention this as it stands. I would not support this bill because it is asking, it says, epilepsy and other conditions. Now I'm gonna play out a scenario that happens every day. People can come into an emergency room or in their doctor's office and have a seizure. Now there's a workup that has to take place. So in that scenario, the common way of which people do this is that uh, we don't know what's the next position, what, what's gonna to happen to that patient next. And I think that there's also the problem for many patients that, um, you know, as much as I appreciate the, and cap absolutely appreciate the physician uh, and patient relationship and that dialogue that's important, um, I, I, I have a real concern about the safety. So at this point, I would have to know a couple of things. One, what are these and other conditions, dot, dot, dot. Two, is there another approach that, how, what guidance are you gonna give the 85,000 physicians in the state of California so that we are very clear on what it is that we are going to do in the case of best evidence-based approach to making a decision. So for those reasons, I'm not in support of it as it stands. Madam President, can I, may I ask, engage Dr. Bolot on a question? Okay. So um, Dr. Bolot, I just wanna make sure I understood you correctly. The, the, the bill right now it is moving away from the language that the current law that is specific to cases that uh, disorders that involve lapses of consciousness and moves to a more expansive uh, uh, from, you know, it's permitted, right? It's a permissive requirement for the, for the physician, but it speaks to the patient who has any physical or mental disability disease or disorder that could affect you know, their safe operation. Um, and is it, did I take then you were asking for what are those types of conditions? Because it's potentially a very broad range, right? Right. And so that's why it's a bigger piece of the pie that people, we have a lot of conditions then that'll yeah. have a lot of permissive, let me decide. So when I think yeah. it also speaks to our seniors, right? You know, we, we, we deal with this five times a week, somebody's parents and children say, mom shouldn't drive, all these things. So I'd like more clarity. I think this is, I think I celebrate the fact that somebody brought the 1957 language forward and maybe it's time to have some, a discussion of what's the real evidence and have a more broad discussion from the motor vehicles and other people. Cause I, I'm no expert in this, but it just, my gut doesn't tell me this is a good thing. Okay. Are there comments or questions? Are people interested in the support of amended position? It sounds like there's a uh, recommendation perhaps to oppose. Dr. Thorpe, if you're speaking, you're on mute. Thank you for reminding me. Um, Madam Chair, I would, I would move that we uh, change our position to oppose unless amended. Yeah. I, I just, I feel like the 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 issue of uh, you know I, I'm not convinced that there isn't a patient safety issue here um, if we liberalize this to to allow a permissive reporting requirement that's my biggest concern with this because I think the your your reporting is going to dramatically drop off 
I mean, if it is, nobody likes a report. But if it's if it's not required, then you're going to not, and people aren't going to report. It's going to be, unless there's a, you know, somebody who's clearly having multiple seizures time after time, they're clearly out of control. But somebody who has complete heart block, who passes out, you know, um, but he, you know, but, it, but then his heart comes back. So when he gets, by the time he gets to the ER, he's not, um, he's not, he's in back in a sinus rhythm again. And this happens fairly frequently that they, you don't catch them in heart block until you actually, they have an event right monitoring them. Uh, it's a, it's a, the idea that you don't have to, that you don't limit their driving until, you know, uh, is, is very concerning to me. And I, I think that um, support unless amended is the wrong position for this board. I think uh, um, the, the issue of covering other conditions that might interfere with the safe operation of a vehicle is, is, is minimal compared to those episodes of loss of consciousness. And loss of consciousness is the really primary issue. So this would mean that if somebody wears oxygen, a doctor who is hyper vigilant might prevent them from driving because they are oxygen. They deem it unsafe for them to operate a vehicle. I don't. I think that this gives on um, it expands the the safe operation issue too broadly, and it doesn't require the reporting narrow enough. So I would, I move to uh, oppose unless amended. Thank you. So we have a motion from Dr. Thorpe uh, for an oppose unless amended position. Is there other support for that? Does someone want to second that? I second it. I have a second from Dr. Mahmood. So is there further discussion? If I may, Madam President. Um, Curious if there's any comment specific to the disciplinary language. I know we've been, you know, looking at the broader, you know, the main purpose of the bill. Does anyone, well, let me ask that question a different way. Does anyone disagree with staff's proposals um, with respect to our ability to take disciplinary action when necessary? I, I don't have any. I mean, my my question is really, um, if you if we're changing the law, if the law gets changed, then I would agree with these uh, additions for disciplinary inclusion. But I think the intent of the bill is wrong, and I would not vote in favor. That's why I recommended the oppose unless amended. I appreciate that. So if I can further clarify the the element where the opposition stems from. So first of all, um, the you believe I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, doctor. So please help me. That the reporting ought to be mandatory. Correct. Okay. And then, and that do and your could you rephrase then your the perspective on uh, moving away from the language that you know, that current law that says you know characterized by lapses of consciousness um, and the broadening out um, that speaks to any physical or mental disability disease or disorder that could affect the safe operation. Are you opposed to that concept as well, doctor? I think that the current the current uh, um, operational process for restricting a license, whether it's for dementia or or for loss of consciousness or um, for physical incapacity, is already there. My concern is that broadening that language could jeopardize people who are legitimately handicapped but need to drive and show competence in driving regardless of their heart failure, their, their paraplegia, their, you know, whatever it might be. And I, I don't see the need for this bill. That's my point. I okay. think this bill is overbroad in its provisions for restricting driving without loss of consciousness. And it's too broad 
and and not narrow enough and it's uh loss of consciousness addressed addressing loss of consciousness so, gotcha so current law is sufficient uh, is is essentially what i'm gathering doctor i believe in 1957. so we have uh, a motion in a second so we've got a motion on the table is there any other further discussion before we call for a vote I'm just wondering if it should be a straight opposed rather than opposed if amended. So I, I know that yeah, we need to get clarity on that because they'll have questions. I mean that this yeah, what 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 Dr. Thorpe's motion speaks to is just the is the key foundation of the bill. <clears throat> um the 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 disciplinary language, which was the staff's main concern, um is is ancillary if we think the whole approach is and that and that current law should remain in effect, and therefore I agree with Ms. Webb that oppose just straight oppose I think makes more sense. I'd be willing to. I'm willing to go with this recommendation. Straight oppose, yes. Yeah, I would be willing to say oppose. Okay, so the motion's been modified. It's now an opposed position. Is there any further discussion from board members on that? All right, seeing none, uh, Janelle, if you could please call the roll. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Thorpe. Yes. Dr. Hauser. Yes. Dr. Mahmood. Yes. Ms. Shong. Yes. Dr. Balat. Yes. Madam President Lawson. Yes. Uh, so that motion carries unanimously. Um, I don't think Do we, my name Mr. was Brooks? called. Oh, sorry, Mr. Brooks. That's fine. Uh, Hi. Can, you, can you make sure you? Mr. Brooks. Aye. Okay, did we miss anybody else? I think we got all the members. Thank you, Madam right. President. Appreciate uh, your patience. Okay. Mr. Motion carries unanimously. Um, we are going to move on to our final agenda item, which is adjournment. <laughs> um, before we uh, move on to that, I think that's right. Am I right, Aaron? We didn't have any further bills. Uh, none that I had. If the members wish to talk about any others, now speak now or forever hold your peace until the next board meeting. All right. Uh, we will move on to adjournment. I'm not seeing anyone raise their hand or jump up quickly. Um, I did want to remind everyone that our next quarterly board meeting is August 24th and 25th. That meeting is going to be in person. It's going to be in Bakersfield in Kern County. Um, we are going to have some, um, I guess, important educational opportunities on the issue of maternal health in California, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to having us be in a jurisdiction that we've not had a board meeting um, in, at least during my tenure on the board, and perhaps uh, maybe never. Um, we are partnering um, with some folks from California Department of Public Health. We're hoping to be able to partner um, with some um, uh, experts on the ground too in Kern County from their Department of Public Health. So we've reached out to them. Um, if any of you want to have input, um, you know, or have have recommendations on that particular issue, feel free to send those along to Ms. Webb um, as we're working on designing that meeting. But um, I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to be in Bakersfield and be in Kern County. Um, it is not as easy to get to as uh, some of our other meeting locations, so please be mindful of that. Um, please do, you know, um, uh, block out the time on your calendar now um, so that we don't have a quorum issue like we had with this meeting leading right up to the, um, the meeting um, because there's a lot of planning that is going into this particular uh, meeting and, and a lot of logistics um, to have us there, have all our speakers there, et cetera. Um, so please do prioritize it. If there is a conflict that you're aware of, please reach out as soon as possible so we um, so that we can know about that uh, to uh, either Mr. Varghese or to Ms. Webb. Um, with that, thank you to everyone, all of the board members, our staff, and to the members of the public who joined us today for participating in our board meeting. And there being no further business uh, today, the meeting is hereby adjourned.